Hi, everybody, especially Melanie and Bert and Cora. Uh, we'll do another chapter of The Fields of Home. Now, let's see now. Chapter 17 is next, and it's entitled, Grandfather Finds the Bees. Okay, let's see here. I plowed all the rest of the week in the high field. Every morning during the early part of the week, Grandfather would come to the field with me. I'd have to drive the team while he held the plow, and we always had trouble. His legs were still weak enough that the plow handles threw him around, and he drove the yellow colt nearly crazy with his shouting. After the first two days, the colt never barked with me when I was alone, but with Grandfather shouting, he'd bark at least once on every round of the field. Found that I found that the best thing for me to do was to bite my teeth together till we plowed two rounds. By that time, Grandfather would be tired enough that I could get him to go hunting the lost bees. One afternoon, late in the week, I heard Grandfather call my name from down over the hill at the east end of the field. His voice sounded as if he were in trouble and needed help in a hurry. I looped the reins over a hame knob, unhooked the yellow coat's traces, and went running as fast as my legs would take me. When I got to the brow of the hill, Grandfather was standing in the green meadow in Lowell Hill's pasture. The minute he saw me, he waved his arm and called, Come quick, Ralphie, come quick. I found them, I found them. I hurried down across the pasture. When I was still twenty rods away, Grandfather shouted, Gory, shakes alive, Ralphie. They be thick and hops and a loading heavy. I calculate the bee tree ain't far distant. As I came near him, he opened the little cigar box he always carried when he was hunting bees. Here, Ralphie, he said as he passed me a little wire hoop with a mosquito netting bag on it. Take some of this cotton, line a couple from that l site clover patch yonder, while I line from hereabouts. By gory, we'll fetch him before the hour's out. I could see he was all excited. But if he had been talking Chinese, it would have meant just as much to me. I took the little net and said, I guess you'll have to show me how to do it. I don't know very much about bees. Great thunderation, Grandfather snapped. What kind of farmer boy be you? Didn't your father learn you nothing? Not about bees, I told him. We never had any. Gory sakes. Well, there ain't nothing to it. Map me whilst I show you. Grandfather bent over, went ranging about like a beagle hound trying to pick up a rabbit scent. He was holding the veil of his bee hat in both hands as he went. After a minute or two, he swooped it down over a clover blossom and sang out, There, by fire! Got her! Got her! The bee had come off the flower, was buzzing round in a fold of the, of the veil when I got there. Now mack her, Ralphie. Mack that white back stripe about behind her wings. Them's the lost ones. Don't take none other. Here, fetch me my bee lining box whilst I show you. Grandfather had dropped the cigar box when he died for the clover blossom. When I took it to him, he was turning the netting back from the bee that he was holding between his thumb and finger. He had it by the sides with its legs up. The tail kept flipping toward his finger with the stinger out. Gory Ralphie macked them legs. Grandfather whispered, Loaded, ain't they? Don't be fat of the bee tree. Now give me a smidgen of that cotton lint with a dab of glue on it. There were loose cotton, short pieces of soap thread, and a little bottle of mucilage in the box. Mucilage is glue. I picked off a bit of cotton, started to take the cork out of the bottle, when Grandfather whispered, Time and tarnation, Ralphie. How you calculate she was going to lug all that? Here, you hold her while I, I fix the flag. I'd held all the bee handling I wanted when Millie and I tried to get the swarm out of the apple tree. The way that stinger was flipping didn't look good to me. It's hard to pass a bee from one person to another. Maybe I was a little too careful. I didn't get a gold hole when Grandfather passed it to me. I jumped when she buzzed in my fingers. Next second, she was gone. Careless, heedless boy, Grandfather snapped as the bee darted away. Once you pay heed to what you're doing, now look sharp for another one. He snatched a bee hat and went ranging around in the clover again. It wasn't a minute before he pounced on another blossom. There, there you be, Ralphie, he sang out. Now you pick a hold of her through the veil. No, not that way. Get her by the back so she can't sting you. I held on as tight as I could without mashing the bee while Grandfather fixed the flag. He took a little wisp of cotton, not much thicker than a daisy petal, dabbed the end of it with a cork of the mucilage bottle, Stuck it to the bee's upcurved back. Now, Ralphie, he whispered, turn her loose and mack her close. As I patted my fingers, the bee zoomed away with the white flag sticking to her. In a second, the bee was out of sight, but the white speck of cotton circled higher and higher till it was above the treetops. Then, 
His grandfather and I stood straight away. Uh, his grandfather and I stood watching with a hand shading our eyes. The speck shot out straight away across the treetops. Grandfather's arm shot out in the exact direction the bee had taken. Sight it, Ralphie, sight it, he called as he held his arm stiff. She'll fly home straight as a musket ball. Mark the course to pass the nigh side the beach in yonder ghetto birch. Give me a stake to mark this spot. Soon as I'd found a stick and pounded it down to mark the spot, I wanted to follow the bee line, hunt the nest. Grandfather wouldn't let me. How you calculate to know when you've gone far enough, he asked me. Well, they're still making as much noise as they did in the orchard. We can hear them for a hundred yards, I told him. If we're on a tree in this line, we should be able to see them, shouldn't we? Grandfather shook his head. Poor Ralphie, with all your big ideas, there's lots of things you don't know, ain't there? Why, you could stand right under the bee tree for a week and never know there is next nor nigh you. Nigh means near to him. Then how can you ever hope to, hope to find them in whole woods full of trees, I asked him. That's what I calculate to learn you. He said, you just keep your eyes open and your mouth shut and watch your old grandpa. He gave me his bee hat to carry, picked up the bee lining box and the little net, and walked to the far end of the meadow. In a few minutes, he popped the net over a bee that was busy on an L-site clover blossom. He let it rest there till he had the flag ready, then picked the bee up and stuck it onto her. When the bee had risen in circles to the treetops, it shot away in a whole different direction from the first one, a little more toward the south and west. Grandfather's arm came up stiff and straight as the speck of the cotton flashed away above the trees. Mack it, Ralphie, he called. Mack it sharp to pass this silver birch and the fork of yonder maple sapling. Get your stake down. Get your stake down, Ralphie. When the stake was down, Grandfather asked, Think you can follow that line straight as a tight string? Keep a setting as you go. Don't hurry. And don't commence till I holler. I calculate it's about 40 rods. Then he picked up his little box and went back to where we'd driven the first stake. It was beyond a jut in the woods, so I couldn't see him. But when he shouted, I started straight down the line the bee had taken. I said it carefully, from one tree to another, and I made sure I didn't get off the line. I couldn't see Grandfather, but every few minutes he'd call, Where be you, Ralphie? And I'd call back, Here. After a little while, I could see Grandfather coming through the woods at my left, sighting from tree to tree as he came. The lines we were walking were at different angles, like the sides of a cut of pie. After I'd gone about the length of a city block, we came together at the point. We were under a big old beech tree that lightning had hit a long time before. Grandfather looked up into it for two or three minutes. Then he said, Go on your head, Ralphie. You laid a straight course and followed it. Mack that little hole just beneath the high crotch. There's a hollow inside there. That's where the bees is. I found the hole all right. It wasn't any bigger than a half dollar. After I'd watched it a few minutes, I said, I can see the hole, but I don't see any bees around it. Wouldn't there be bees coming and going if the nest was in there? I calculate there is, Ralphie. I calculate there is, Grandfather said as he peered. But lacking sunlight on the wings to take a powerful sharp eye to see one. Then what makes you so sure this is the nest, I asked him. Glory sakes, Ralphie, don't you know a bee tree once you see one? Mack the dull back beneath the crotch. Hollow inside, natural hive. Didn't you ever see bees going to hole in a hollow tree? No, I said, but I've heard they do. Do they make honey in there? Glory sakes, of course they do. Have to store provender for the winter, don't they? I recollect one time I and Levi found nine into a hundred pounds in a town of great hollow-hatted oak, mostly sugared off. Some of it must have been there from ten years back. Grandfather stood four or five minutes looking up in the tree. At last, he said, take an all-fired tall ladder to fetch him down. Curious things, bees. More sense than most people. Always providing ahead. Always laying away for more than one hard winter. Putting something by for the generation to come. Never tire of watching them. Suddenly he turned to me and said, Lay down, Ralphie. Lay down here whilst I let you see him work. Father had once told me that looking up from the bottom of a well, you'd see stars in the daytime. I thought maybe lying on the ground would let me see bees in the shade the same way. I didn't want to see them work. So I lay down on my back and looked up toward the hole. Now stay right where you be, Ralphie, Grandfather told me. Whilst I go flag, whilst I go flag three or four for you to watch. I'll holler when they line out. Keep your eyes open wide. Mack how quick they came in on a bee line. Then he picked up his bee lining box, started off toward the little meadow. It didn't seem as if I'd been there more than two or three minutes. 
just looking up to the tree, thinking of what Grandfather had said about the bees. I heard him call, There you be, Ralphie. I opened my eyes as wide as I could. In three or four seconds, a tiny white streak shot like an arrow over the trees from the direction of Grandfather's voice. It dipped and zoomed toward the trunk above me at a mile a minute. When it's close to the tree, it seemed to almost to stop, then disappeared into the little hole. Grandfather sent three more five bees, each from a different direction, and each one came straight from the sound of his voice, though it had been shot from a gun, dipped, zoomed in exactly the same way, braked, and disappeared into the hole. I was so busy watching and thinking about the bees, I didn't hear Grandfather until he stepped beside me, stopped beside me. Curious, ain't it, Ralphie, how the Almighty provided for all his critters? Do you mark how the bees come in straight as a top line? Taint from seeing, I don't calculate, Ralphie. They'll come into a hollow stump just as straight. It's a gift of the Almighty's, so they can hide their nest and always find it. I had gotten up, and Grandfather and I both stood looking up at the little hole that was the doorway of the bee's nest. After a few minutes, he half whispered, Taint right, Ralphie. Taint right, I suppose. I and you using the gift from the Almighty against them, setting them down by the straight line of their flight. He stood for a few minutes more, then went on, we ain't doing them no harm, just fetching them home so we can watch them after and during the winter. So we can watch after them during the winter. Most probably the Almighty made him a purpose to sweeten the vittles of his children. Gurry, ain't better than new honey on a hot biscuit. There was a deep shadow in the woods, but as we stood there, a thin shaft of golden sunlight streamed through an opening in the leaves and lighted Grandfather's face. When it touched his eyes, he jumped, almost as though it had hurt him. Gurry, sakes alive, he sang out. Time flies. Must be getting nigh under evening. He looked quickly up and down the trunk of the tree. By fire, he said, I calculate that'll take the longest ladder in the barn. Come on, Ralphie, come on. I knew left the stir as stiff as for to get him hive before night falls. He hurried off to the house and called back to me. Fetch the horses. Fetch the horses, Ralphie, while you go get the bee trappings ready. When I went back to the pile, the yellow coat had the harness pretty well tangled up. Might have taken me 15 minutes to straighten it out, drive to the barn, hitch the horses to the stone drag. By that time, Grandfather had dragged the long ladder out of the barn and wood punk smoking in an old iron kettle, a white beehive, bellows, veils, and gloves laid out on the yard wall. What in time and time nation you've been dawdling around for, Grandfather shouted as I pulled up to the foot of the wall. Time flies, time flies. Can't fetch bees out of a tree in the dark. Here. Hold this tunnel ladder down. Hook it fast while he fits the trappings. There she be. There she be, Ralphie. Let's get it going, and your old car grandpa will learn you how to fetch home a swarm of lost bees. The nearer we came to the bee tree, the more I worried. The nest was nearly 30 feet above the ground. I had no idea how to get the bees out of it, and I could remember too much about what had happened to Millie, uh, what had happened when Millie tried to get them out of the apple tree. Whenever I tried to ask Grandfather anything about it, he'd chuckle all and say, You just mack your old Grandpa. He'll show you how to fetch him down in jig time. We could only take the team as far as the lower end of the high stony field. The sun was behind the woods on the high ridge, and as I and hits, Grandfather kept snapping, Let be, let be, time flies. All the time, he was snapping at me. He kept blowing air into the smudge kettle with a little bellows. By the time I was finished, he had a smoke column that rose as high as the treetops. The long ladder was awkward to carry through the thick woods and stand up against the bee tree. Half a dozen times when we got caught in the other growth, a wedge tight between trees, Grandfather called me careless and heedless, but at the same time he seemed excited and happy. I was worried because the top of it didn't reach up to the bee hole by three feet. But when I tried to tell Grandfather it wouldn't be safe, he only yapped, "'Taint nothing, taint nothing.' Leave your fretting and go fetch in the stuff. First off, fetch the hive and rope and stir your stiffers. I calculate you get them hived and during twilight. When I came back, Grandfather had made a little foundation of rocks for the hive at the foot of the tree. He didn't let me stop to help him place it, but hurried me right back for the rest of the trappings. Take care you don't trip with that tunnel smudge kettle, he called after me. Leave us dry. Be all fired easy to burn the woods down. Story of Stivers, Ralphie. Daylight's wasting. I heard as much as I could on the way out, but I was awfully careful when I brought the smudge kettle back. And Grandfather's having blown the punk, the kettle, bail and all, was hotter than toffet. 
even though through a double glove it burned my hand. I didn't dare set it down among the dry leaves, and everything, every time it touched my leg, it felt as if I'd fallen on a hot stove. Between trying to juggle a couple bee hats, the gloves, the bellows, hammer and nails, and keep the kettle away from my legs, I probably did look as if I was dancing. When I was 50 yards from the tree, Grandfather called, Quits a plane, quits a plane, fetch some bellows in my bee hat. Time and time, nation, why don't you hurry? He was standing at the foot of the ladder, had passed the rope around the trunk of the tree, through the back of his suspenders, and tied a running noose in the end of it. All the time I'd been bringing the stuff in, I'd been telling myself I wasn't going to let Grandfather see how scared I was to climb that ladder after the bees. But it never occurred to me he might be doing it, might, might be going to do it himself. The minute I saw him standing there, I knew that was what he was planning. I got the same feeling in my stomach that you have sometimes when the elevator goes down quickly. Before I even stopped to think, I hollered, No, no, I'm going up after them. My voice sounded just the way my stomach felt. Instead of being mad because I hollered at him, Grandfather's voice was mild as milk. Why, Ralphie, he said, you ain't scared about your old grandpa falling, be you? Thunderation. Father climbed ladders when she was ten years older than I be. It's all in knowing how. Now fetch me my bee gloves and hat, and get you on on. Twilights are falling. I put on my gloves, pulled the netting sleeves up over my arms, and crammed the hat tight onto my head, with a bee veil hanging down around my shoulders. I'd hardly finished when Grandfather said, Hand me the bellows, Ralphie. I'm a-going up. You follow after with a smudge kettle. He hadn't put his bee hat on, but squeezed it under one arm, along with the bellows. With both hands, he flipped the rope a couple of feet up the far side of the tree trunk, stepped up two rungs on the ladder, and flipped the rope again. When his feet were just above my head, he looked down and said, Keep leaning in closer again the ladder, Ralphie. You'll have a hard chance with only one free hand for hanging on. Then he flipped the rope again and went on. It was hard enough to handle the hot kettle on the ground, but ten times worse on the ladder. Besides being hot, it was belching smoke like a chimney, the chokiest smoke I ever had to breathe. We got along all right till Grandfather reached the top of the ladder. When his face was just about level with the bee hole, he knotted the rope so he could lean back against it with both hands free. I heard a bee buzz. Looked up just in time to see it light on the bottom of the little hole in the front of Grandfather's face, then disappear. He took the bellows up from under his arm, but lifted his bee hat, squeezed there tight. Without it on, I was sure he'd be stung to death. But before I could speak, he whispered, Heist the kettle up here so as I can get at it, Ralphie. Higher, higher. Shun on up here and take a hold on my legs so you can heist it higher. Grandfather had both feet braced on the top rung of the ladder. He was leaning back a couple of feet against a tight loop of rope. I was so afraid his feet would slip, or that the rope would come untied, that I was shaking all over. And I didn't dare grab hold of him for fear of throwing him off balance. I'd only hesitated a few seconds when he whispered, Take a hold. Take a hold, Ralphie. Don't be scared. I ain't going to let you fall. I stood up high a minute. There's a picture here, a couple of pages back, of this whole operation going on. There they are, up on the ladder by the, by the bee tree. Grandfather's up on top, and, and Ralph is down below him with a smudge kettle. Wow. You see the rope going around the tree? Ha! Huh. Now, let's see. My arm was shaking like, like the legs of a frightened dog, but I hooked it around Grandfather's knee and climbed up a couple more rungs. Then I held the hot kettle as, I, as high as I could while he sucked the bellows full of smoke. His leg under my arm was as steady as if it had been on a limb of trees, a limb of the tree. I knew from it that he was neither afraid of falling nor of the bees stinging his bare face. Just knowing it made me stop shaking, and I didn't even wince when the kettle burned my arm a little as I held it up to him. After the bellows were filled with smoke, he held it tight to the beehole and squeezed slowly. Then... Quick as a flash, he poked the empty bellows into the top of his trousers and said, Go down, Ralphie, go down, that'll fetch him. As soon as I was down a few rungs, I leaned against the ladder and looked up at Grandfather. He'd swiped the bee hat out from under his arm, was holding the open end of the veil around the little hole as the bees streamed out. There were still more bees coming out of the hole after the veil had become a sackful. I'd been so interested I'd forgotten to go down any farther. Grandfather closed the mouth of the veil 
and slacked his rope off enough to let it slip a foot or two. Going down, Ralphie, going down. Your old grandpa's got him. Calculate the queen somewhere in the hat. When he was far enough down to hook his free arm around the ladder lung, Grandfather untied the safety rope and let it fall. All around him, the air was thick with bees. They seemed to pay no attention to them as he came slowly down, rung by rung. As his foot reached the ground, he let out a long breath and half whispered, There, by Gary Ralphie, guess we showed him what kind of logs makes wide shingles. He lifted the cover, dumped part of the bees into the hive. Then he knelt, placed the throat of the veil before the stoop of the beehive, and stepped back. Sit you down, Ralphie, he said as he stepped over to a big stump. Sit you down with your old grandpa and let's mack him for a spell. Happen I got the queen on the inside, they'll all follow her in. The sun had gone down. The sky through the branches of the trees was still bright blue, but twilight was spreading through the woods. A thrust from somewhere toward the meadow sang her evening song. Frogs tuned their fiddles in the swale along the brook. From higher up the ridge, the crow called three evenly spaced, harsh notes. They were gone for a moment. Then, when the woods across the valley echoed them back, there was music in them. Listening to the twilight sounds, I'd forgotten all about the bees till Grandfather whispered, Curious, bees, Mac Aldera piling up in front of the hive. After sitting quiet a few minutes, he went on. Was all men as respecting of the Almighty as bees is the queen, there'd be no call for neither jails nor courthouses. Why didn't they sting you when you went up there without your bee veil on? I asked him. Gory, why would they? He asked. It's cool of the evening, and I want scared of them. Bees won't generally sting you unless you're scared. Calculate their smell the scare on you, same as a dog does. Then his voice rose all. By fire, she's in, Ralphie. Knock out, they appear to be flowing across the threshold. Don't be long. Don't be long now till we nail them up and fetch them home. Wow. And that's the end of that chapter. Boy, they got the bees. And that's chapter 70. And next chapter is chapter 18. It's titled, I Meet Annie. Hmm. Okay. Okay, see you later, everybody.